Hi, welcome to Offscript. I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Today on the show, we're taking a look at Disney's Cruella. Yes, the prequel to 101 Dalmatians starring everybody's favorite dog killer is officially out. We're excited to talk about whether or not it's worth your time. Uh, we're also going to take a look at John Krasinski's A Quiet Place Part 2. Uh, what I believe to be gimmicky horror, Andy says, is actually pretty good. <laughs> we went and saw it. And we'll let you know uh, why it's breaking the box office this weekend as well. We're going to talk about some things that are coming up in June, July. Big summer at the movies. Huge summer at the movies. Everybody's stoked to get their movies out. Now that the pandemic is kind of coming around full circle, right? Uh, and, and things are happening. So we're going to talk about what's coming out. First things first, though, when you get to the news, our first story. Oscars. The Academy Awards announced dates for the 94th Oscars and the key events leading up to it. Andy, going to be honest, didn't read this article. Can you tell me what, <laughs> you tell me what this is about? Sure, sure thing. So there's two main points. The Oscars were originally scheduled for, uh, this would be 2022. Uh, they were supposed to be in late February, um, but they got pushed back another month to late March. So it's March 27th, uh, 2022. And the main reason for that is to give people enough time to watch all the films that are nominated primarily the Oscar members themselves who are notorious for not watching all the films which are nominated. Um, so that's, that's a, one of the, that's part one of this story. The other big part is that uh, the eligibility eligibility cutoff will be December 31st. So it had been pushed to February 28th because of the, the pandemic. Uh, so that's being adjusted and will now be, be kind of normal because the window is generally end of the end of the year. Um, so, but it's official December 31st um, is the cutoff. So March, I guess March 31st through December 31st is the eligibility window. And then the ceremony itself will be taking place on March 27th, 2022. Yeah. Um, so I, I think like you said, the most interesting part of this is kind of the eligibility window. Um, you know, when they're going to do it, that's great. Oscars happens every year. By God, I hope it's on some kind of internet screen this year instead of just broadcast television, but we'll see. Um, the films that are going to be eligible are most interesting, right? Because like you said, last year, because of the pandemic, they bumped the eligibility, eligibility window to the end of February, giving everybody an extra couple of months to get films in for 2019, right? And now this is the 2020. No, 2021. That's how that works. Good Lord. I, right. I get confused every year with what films are actually up for Oscars versus going to be up next time the Oscars are rolling around. But the point is, this year, the only films that will be considered for the Academy Awards are films that came out between March 1st and December 31st. That is it. If it came out in January and February, already happened, right? We, we've moved past right. it. That's, that's, that's kind of the long and short of it, which I think is good because there's going to be a ton of things coming out this year. There are already... It's it's a fat slate for summer, man. Like normally, normally we do upcoming releases. We talk about three months worth of the, worth of movies. This this show we're only doing two because there's so many things coming out. So there will be plenty to see uh, in that window. I, I think uh, you know yeah, it makes sense. It's a good thing. And that's positive for everybody. Hopefully, again, we can watch it at home on our phones instead yeah, of having that'll to, be to the big change. <laughs> that is yeah. in the, whole of the historically low viewership this year and the adjustment um, yeah. to hopefully get more viewers. Mm. So we'll see. Anyway, keep it here on off script for more Oscars news. Next up, a quiet place. Part two is killing it at the box office with a pandemic era, best $57 million opening. Now, that's over four days. I think you said before we jumped into this, right, Andy? Yes. That includes the Memorial day uh hall as well it still made 48 million over the weekend over the three-day weekend uh which is uh a pandora <laughs> era best as as said um That's right. which means it's made more money than things like mortal Kombat and king kong or kong godzilla vs kong uh so it's a hit it's a certified hit even by non-pandemic numbers um and we'll probably go on to do a uh, very well uh, globally as well so it's a big hit at the box office already yeah, a sign big, that we're coming win. out of this. I, I think so. Yeah, big win for Paramount. It's worth mentioning this is basically what they expected it to make before the pandemic. That's they're, they're pretty much at what they thought it was going to make anyway, which is huge. Now, there's a couple things going for it, right? Number one, uh, this is following a film that a lot of people revered. A lot of people like The Quiet Place One. That movie did really well. It's good horror. Number two, it's coming up on a holiday weekend, Memorial Day weekend. You got family in town. You get rid of them for a couple hours at the end of Monday night. You'll go see a movie, right? And number three, people, I think, are ready to go see movies again. 
And number four, and this is a smaller mention, but people have said, hey, why isn't Cruella doing as well, right? That's PG-13, Quiet Place 2 is rated R. The answer is because Cruella is not immediately as culturally relevant, right? It didn't have a sequel, a prequel. It was out like two or three years ago. And also it came out on Disney Plus same day. So people could stay home and rent it. Cruella did get $26.5 million over the weekend, which is nothing to scoff at. And hey, if, if the numbers add up on Disney's uh, premier access offerings at $30 a pop, they arguably did better than A Quiet Place 2. But we won't know because Disney doesn't publish those numbers. But for what it's worth, still a great weekend at the box office. It seems like, uh, it seems like we're coming out of this thing. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. We'll never know those figures. Uh, Disney will never release those uh, to see how much it made. But what we will be able to tell is, will they keep up this model? Will they keep up this hybrid release for their their big properties? Because they're planning to do this for Marvel's Black Widow, uh, which I was really surprised to see that you know a new Marvel movie comes out and you're going to be able to watch it at home if you want. Um, yeah. That's pretty wild. But if this is not, if the numbers aren't good, then they won't continue to do that. So we'll kind of get to be seen. Yeah um we'll see what happens you know keep it here for more and one thing worth mentioning if you don't have the means to see a quiet place too or don't feel safe going to see it it will be on paramount plus in 45 days so their their big push for getting it in theaters is great but ultimately a month and a half you'll be able to watch it at home so no pressure i guess yeah that that's really cool and, and again that's a that's a product of the the pandemic itself was the shortened release of 45 days and you're on a streaming service mm-hmm so not too shabby, I guess. Anyway, it's about it for news. Uh, there was one other story I wanted to talk about, but I didn't put it in the outline. So I'll just briefly mention it here. Uh, Andy, did you see that story about John Cena uh, apologizing for a comment he made <laughs> yeah. in the Fast Nine? Yes, nines? I did. Okay, so so I just saw a, a link to it here. You know what? I'm just going to, we're just, we're, we'll do it live. We'll do it live. We'll do it, do it live. I know fun. a little bit about this. So I know a little bit about this too. So so Fast Nine is out in China. Uh, it's out in domestic markets. Uh, well, global markets. It's not here domestically, but it will be coming here soon. Uh, after its first week, uh, its first weekend, Fast Nine is doing very well. Its second weekend is doing very poorly. There was an issue of John Cena in an interview uh, saying Taiwan was a country. He, the next day, he apologized via video in Chinese. Uh, he caught a bunch of flack in the West for it. Apparently folks in the East didn't like it, but it seems like this may not be exclusively because of John Cena. Uh, they've also had a couple other really large films come out over there and traditionally fall off for these films has been pretty quick. So it's hard to say whether or not this is exactly what's going on. So if you read this story about John Cena insulting China, we don't <laughs> know that's what's going on, but I know Andy actually does know a little bit more about Chinese culture than I do. Andy, Andy, any hot takes on this? Well, I'll say that the the, the situation, the political situation between China and Taiwan is incredibly complex and is a very long-standing dispute uh, between Taiwan, China, and how they're recognized in in the world. The U.S. recognizes does not recognize Taiwan as a separate nation, but they do have their separate government. They have separate passports. It's a very very touchy hot hot subject that you definitely don't want to you want to avoid at all costs especially if you're a celebrity you don't want to get wrong which john cena uh apparently did in his in his comments um and so that's kind of what's going on there it's it's a very uh touchy situation there and it has been for a for a long long time um and, and you know sometimes you know politics and film cross over quite often actually and you you, you get these kind of minefields that you, you have to try and na navigate as a as a filmmaker or an actor well said and also one more thing worth mentioning before we jump into cruella uh another reason it may not be doing well supposedly reviews aren't that good for fast nine over in china so i don't know what that's about but just for what it's worth apparently Impossible. people have seen it <laughs> said it wasn't that awesome i don't know uh, anyway, we should move on to our first proper film of the episode. Andy, thanks for uh, tolerating my brief surprise news story. I, I totally forgot to ready for anything. Thought here and was like, you were you had a whole statement. It was very, it was very, very succinct. Well done. <laughs> uh, please, whenever you're ready, let's jump right into the review. Cruella. So this is the latest live action slash Disney remake of the beloved uh, villain from 101 Dalmatians, a 1961 classic uh, starring 
Cruella de Vil as the main villain. And we get her backstory uh, starring Emma Stone as the titular character, Cruella. We meet her as a young girl. She is orphaned. Uh, she has no parents. She's homeless in, in London. Uh, and she meets uh, two friends, Horace and uh, Jasper, um, who they kind of form a gang uh, of thieves and they're pickpockets and they kind of survive on the streets uh, and, you know, all through into adulthood. This looks like it happens for 20 years. And uh, <laughs> she, but uh, all the meantime, uh, Cruella is, is designing and creating disguises for all their capers. So that's how she learns to, to, to sew and make clothing and to, you know, be, be uh, a, a clothing designer, clothing makers through these this really clever ploy of, of designing costumes for their their heists and the, and their their stealings. Uh, this eventually lands her a a job uh, at a I don't remember the place, but with the Baroness played by Emma Thompson, who is a big fashion mogul in in the city, and uh, she recognizes uh, Cruella slash Estella's talents and recruits her. And you know she, she's very mean. It's very Devil Wears Prada. Which I haven't actually seen. That character is pretty famous, um, and it's a, it reminded me a little bit of, of, of Phantom Thread. And so she, Emma Thompson, is this like very shrill, very mean, uh, kind of cold-hearted but brilliant uh, fashionista. And this is kind of where we get our setup uh, for the movie. There's it's it's very long, um, I, but but I actually didn't mind the length uh, for for once. Um, we have a lot of we have really great performances. We have good music cues. There's a lot going on in this movie, and I was really surprised uh, because I had heard some negative buzz about it, and I wasn't thrilled at the long runtime. Um, but I actually re really ended up like liking it, and we can talk about uh, that a lot more uh, in detail. But Zach, what did you think? Devil Wears Prada. I'm putting this on the outline right now. You've never seen Devil Wears Prada, bruh. I've seen like <laughs> scenes and stuff from it. It's, you know, I wouldn't <laughs> mind revisiting it. So I'm going to put it on the watch list for a, if we have nothing going on at some point, I'm going to throw that on there. Otherwise, won't worry about it. Yes, uh, Cruella is a lot like the Devil Wears Prada. It's also a lot like Joker. Uh, it seems to draw inspiration from a number of things. Obviously, 101 Dalmatians, but it's a new vision from Craig Gillespie, uh, director of I, Tanya. Uh, who really approached this with a different kind of purview and wanted to make a movie that felt, I feel like more like its own thing than a derivative of a Disney property. Obviously it's got to have some mainstay callbacks to the proper property. I was not expecting to see Horace and Jasper running around. I, I, I was not expecting to find uh, Anita and, and Roger uh, from the 101 Dalmatian story in this film, but Emma Stone is a delight as Cruella. Emma Thompson is surprisingly vicious as the Baroness, and I think there's a lot this movie does right. It's not great. It may not even be good, but for the live-action Disney films I've seen, this is probably like top three. It might be the best one. Um, it's it's surprisingly good. Andy, you were surprised to, to find that you actually enjoyed it, right? Yeah, yeah. So the the live action remakes have not been very good or very interesting. Like they're basically shot for shot remakes. We're talking about Aladdin, The Lion King, Mulan. A lot of this stuff just rehashes what we've already seen. Doesn't do anything new, and they're fairly boring and difficult to to watch. And so I really didn't have a high bar for this. And I was really surprised that we got a very original and different story. And they had to make a lot of changes because, you know, the villain in the original 1961 cartoon wants to skin these dogs to make a coat. Uh, so they yeah. kind of had to navigate that whole thing. And it, they essentially don't have that as her motivation. That's just kind of uh, not the they had to work around that, basically. Uh, but the the characters are interesting. The performances are are really astounding. Like uh, Emma's. Yeah, Emma Stone reminds me of uh, when Johnny Depp first played Jack Sparrow. Like all of a sudden, we got this incredible pirate character who was nominated for an Oscar, and this is that's that level of what we get from her. I wouldn't be surprised if she get, picks up a nomination at the end of the year um, as well. And like you said, we have these influences of like like I said, I joked last last week on the show. I was like, what are they going to do for two hours? Give us a joke, Joker. And there's literally yes. you can tell the influence of that movie on this as an origin story. There's similarities of her being orphaned, her kind of longing for acceptance and parentage, and like this enemy of a uh, of an elitist person as as the enemy. It's there's some really interesting parallels. 
I mean, even down to the cinematography, we have handheld shots, we have muted lighting and colors, we have like striking visual imagery and sharp grain of film. Like, it very much feels like Joker. It's surprising how much it feels like Joker, because I think I kind of thought it was going to be that, but like... Man, it, it it's unabashed in it. And, and in a way, I think that confidence is really important. It's something I didn't feel in like Guy Ritchie's Aladdin or even uh, The Lion King, which is John Favreau. None of those films felt particularly confident. It felt like they had somebody from Disney with their hand on, on the leash that was like, no, no, you're not going to get too far away from what this is supposed to be. This is going to be what it is. But I think because Cruella is derivative, and it also has to follow in the footsteps of Glenn Close's performance in the 101 Dalmatians remake and 102 Dalmatians. She did two of those movies. And yeah. Also worth mentioning, Glenn Close produced this film. Her names are in the opening credits. So she was definitely involved with what was happening here. Um, this movie is able to take a further step away and do something different and do something bolder. And it is a great step forward for what Disney is doing. Um, it's, it's frustrating because you see what Disney can do if they have to tell a story. That's the thing. If you're telling a backstory, you don't have anything to go off of. You have to come up with a lot of original material, and that's what we do here. And same thing with uh, Maleficent, which I haven't seen, but I've heard really good things about. Uh, when they have to come up with a story, they can do a great job. So it's frustrating to see them not do that on a lot of these other remakes. Yeah, but let's jump into what works about this movie. Again, it's not not all that glitters is gold. It is it is not by any means like a great film. Uh, and we'll get to re formal recommendations at the end. But comparing it to other Disney films, it's hard to say this isn't some kind of standout. So let's get into it. Uh, where do you want to start? The casting, uh, the production, the set design, uh, the costuming? Jesus. Jeez. Yeah, let's talk about the uh, the costume. So that's one thing that, that this takes place in like a, a, the fashion world. And it gives you know the movie... Uh, carte blanche to just create these really incredible costumes like every time you see emma thompson she's in a different fabulous outfit um yeah. it, it, it's all like high and because they're in this world of like high fashion as well it's it's turned up to 11 so they're both like competing you know it's, it's a little bit of um uh, again phantom thread of all things uh is is invoked uh, another movie about kind of uh, high fashion rivalry so we get these great yeah. costumes, and also there's there's this plot point of of Cruella. No one knows who Cruella is, like her, the real person. She's kind of showing up and like upstaging the Baroness, and she does it several times. And so that's just an excuse for these like really elaborate kind of Banksy style <laughs> fashion shows that like come come in and come out real quick. Yeah, you, you hit the nail right on the head. It's worth mentioning the original Dalmatians film was set in the 60s. Uh, originally, I thought it was in like Paris, but it's unclear, I think, where exactly it is. Um, but uh, I did I did rewatch it before I w watched Cruella. I had nothing going on on a Saturday before I was supposed to go see it. And I was like, <laughs> I'll throw on Disney Plus and, and give 101 Dalmatians a rewatch. Holds up great, by the way. Um, but like, this movie evokes a lot of the similar visual style of that film. And a lot of those backgrounds were watercolors. They they were they were muted tones, but they were striking and a lot of a lot of strong lines in the animation. And I think the set design and the costuming here follows that almost to a T. It's it's actually really fantastic uh, remembering the original film and kind of what the buildings look like. These tall, slender row houses and and lots of trees on these like nice kind of paths and. This movie does that, but it also kind of runs with it because this is set in the 60s. I think it's formerly the 60s. And so you have to hit these kind of fashion hallmarks of what was working then and what was cutting edge then, as well as kind of this push for the future. Like you said, Cruella comes in as almost this like Banksy kind of character and evoking an older Joker, uh, Jack Nicholson's Joker from Tim Burton's Batman. She becomes this kind of vigilante character who will appear and disappear at a moment's notice with her uh, flash and, and glam to upstage the Baroness's next great party or to steal the limelight from the Baroness's uh, next great fashion line. And when everybody turns and looks at her, just like that, she's gone. And Cruella is this 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 vigilante individual who everybody wants to know about in the fashion world. And you said you said it perfect, just like Banksy. Everybody wants to, to know what she's going to do next. Her 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 stuff is the hottest stuff because nobody can get it. It's it's viral in a time when there was no internet. 
really creative, really creative approach to the writing, really creative build for Cruella to be this kind of career fashion vogue icon uh, in her own way. But she didn't start that way, right? Obviously, she starts, like you said, at the top as, as, as kind of this orphan character who Emma Stone, I wish got a bit more time to play with. And maybe that's where we should jump into plot. With with the when she's a young girl, you mean? Yeah, like that kind of rise from like you know how she gets started as a as, as a young girl with a streak of white in her hair, which is genetic. It's not cho- <laughs> it's not chosen. That's just the color of her hair. Mm. Uh, to becoming like this 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 rival to the Baroness because that doesn't come out of nowhere, right? None of that is in the original film. Like that's that's kind of a new thing. Right. I, I mean, they did a really good job of having this uh, classic Disney backstory, dead parents. You got to have dead parents in, if it's Disney. Um, of course. Where, where, yeah, she she has to uh, climb, kind of, uh, you know, use her street smarts and her, her talent for uh, dressmaking to, to, yeah, navigate into this world and, you know, meet her rival, become basically her equal and then over overthrow them. Um, it's, it's a really interesting, you know, character development and, and build up, and they do a, a convincing job. Like, I, again, I was thinking like, how are they going to have this person go like become this? Yeah. How, how are you going to get there? And, and they do it by, I think just unabashedly kind of saying, Hey, this, this is her character. This is what she's about. Like I said, when you first see her as a young girl, she's got half black and half white hair and it's never like. It's it's not dyed. That's just the color of her hair, and they, they they imply that she has this. Well, they just tell you she has this kind of almost like bipolar disorder. She has this other side of her that's kind of evil and dark, uh, uh, and and is is what her mother deems Cruella. That's 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 the dark side of you. But we're not gonna we're not gonna go there. We're not gonna be that person. You're good. You're nice. You're a good person. And the movie stays through that through line, but 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 our, our character starts to kind of lean into this Cruella alter ego she has. And before she knows it, it kind of overtakes her and she falls into the madness. Obviously, the ride is not as bumpy, well, not as smooth, I guess you should say, as Joker. Because that has a similar plot. I mean, you've got a character who who is kind of kind of nuts, but stays away from it. And then before you know it, leans all the way in. You can't go back. Um, this does the same thing, but it makes her more redeemable mainly by being a dog lover which i did not expect uh she has a puppy (laughs) and loves dogs and does not murder a single dog in this film and at one point it's (laughs) why she does then newsflash she didn't yeah um it it, this movie kind of rewrites that history for disney by saying hey yeah in in you know other other tales you've heard that she's a bad person but maybe not maybe she's not so bad maybe that was just slander right maybe that was just a smear campaign for cruella it's a little bit of a retcon uh, of the character, yes. you know, so they can continue to, to use it for. And, and again, this is completely fine that they do this in, in comics all, all the time. Um, but yeah, her, she, she, similar to Joker, she starts to go kind of down the rabbit hole of madness. The, the big difference is here because it's Disney and it's a family film. They pull it back. You know, she starts to go towards the edge and then like they pull her back to like a, a likable character who then I'm sure they're going to franchise out uh from from this point yeah. but that 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 is the interesting point because about halfway into the film you're like man this is actually getting really dark i'm surprised this is where this is going um and she she decides at one point that she is just gonna be cruella 100 percent of the time she's not a estella uh and she's just kind of mean all the time you do even to uh jasper and horace who are supposed to be her friends and family um, and she kind of just really leans into it. And then she kind of realizes she can't be like that uh, all the time. Um, but like I said, I, w- I was a little surprised at how dark it got there for a little bit. Yeah. So let's talk about kind of those side characters a little bit. I did not expect to find Jasper and Horace as like childhood pals in, in the original film. They are goons that she hires who she may have worked with in the past. That's about it. There's not a whole lot to them. They're alcoholics. You know, their 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 hands are shaky because they need like they're 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 not good dudes at all. And this paints them as like childhood friends and good people who do the wrong thing, but they're victimless crimes and nobody really gets hurt. And like that's pretty cool, but it still felt really forced. Additionally, she's friends with Anita Darling, uh, who is the Anita from 
uh, 101 Dalmatians. It took me o- over half the film before I put that connection together. And I was watching with Christine at home. We watched it on Disney Plus, and I was like, wait, wait, wait. Is that supposed to actually be the Anita from 101 Dalmatians, like the mom? And the, and she was like, yeah. And I was like, and that guy over there is supposed to be Roger from, from 100. And she was like, yeah. I was like, okay. Well, first off, neither of them look anything like their original character designs, which is fine. And and secondly, when 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 Cruella Deville calls Anita Anita darling in in the film, she's not saying darling is her last name. She's addressing her as a term of like endearment because she's a friend, right? And really, she's trying to get to her puppies. This film just runs with it and goes, oh, "Darling's her last name," so you know that's the way it is. Which is you know that's okay, I guess. A little hokey. It reminds me of like like trying to trying to force in nostalgia bait and star wars like like rogue yeah. one or solo right like you remember these characters don't you oh yeah you remember you remember when they were in 101 dalmatians and that's that's all well and good but um overall they're all played okay i i didn't have much love for paul walter hauser's horace he does probably the worst british <laughs> accent i've heard since keanu reeves and dracula um <laughs> it's two weeks ago horrid uh, he's really so- i don't know yeah so a lot of this film is really cartoonish um, in, in the way our characters act. And it's definitely, we see that in Jasper and Horace and, and that's how some of it, again, it's aimed at families. It's aimed at kids. You have, it kind of walks us in between being in the real world and also being very cartoonish in the way that it's, it's characters. Like when, when Cruella first gets hired at, at a kind of a fashion house, there's a very mean uh, kind of manager who's, uh, again like a caricature of of a manager and we get a lot of that throughout most of the film but it, it kind of walks uh both sides that english accent is is pretty bad though it's i mean he's like dubbed in in scenes like visibly dubbed because it was so bad on set they had to go back <laughs> later and be like well let's have you re-record it um really like raspy i, I feel like i get what he was going for but just not whatever emma thompson's a delight um i had people say she stole scenes from Emma Stone. I disagree. I was definitely still glued to like whatever Corella was doing in the film, but Emma Stone is the Baroness is, is really good stuff. And she's got a long history working with Disney in 2017. She was the voice of Mrs. Potts in the live action beauty and the beast in 2013. She was PL Travers and saving Miss Banks. Um, she definitely hits this like perfect note of like smarmy, mustache twirling villain while also being really charming and like a delight to watch on screen she's she's good stuff and i think she served as a really good foil for cruella to say hey at first you're my hero now you're my enemy and soon you will be below me like i i will rise past you and that's good stuff like it it gives us a good a good bar for success for cruella to have to 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 kind of smash through you know um and and it gives us a lot of good well it 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 uh, it was really great to see two like female leads basically be like front yeah. and center, um, and you're right, Emma Emma Thompson. There's two Emmas. Emma Thompson um, is great. She's chewing the scenery as much as as Emma Stone. You know, she is mean. She is cold. Uh, they you know they have a, a connection, and and they're very similar in in personality. Uh, and again, it's scene stealing. Both both of yeah. them. Um, you know. It's it's really good stuff, and like I said, it's great to see two two female leads, and that you know, there's not like a romance or anything like that. That, that you know, like some weird love triangle um, shenanigans or anything like that either. Sure. Now we don't have much more time to talk about it, but I'm curious, what didn't work about this movie? Right. So far, it's been all sunshine and rainbows. <laughs> it's a li- it's a little long. It's two hours fifteen minutes, um, and I didn't a really little. really mind. It. I didn't really mind the length and I, I actually saw this in, in theaters as well. So I think that always helps with the length. Um, yeah. Things always feel longer at home for some reason, if they're really long. Um, but it, it is long, especially for, for a kid's movie, but it really has a lot going on. There are a lot of big stunts and scenes and, and setups and payoffs. And there's a lot of Cruella and a lot of Emma Stone. Uh, it's a lot of entertainment. The kids are going to love it. Yeah, so it, it's definitely too long for sure. Um, yeah, I think you could have easily cut probably 20 minutes out of this film. And I think somebody needed to go over the script just one more time with a red pen and just cut some stuff out. It just has a little too much to do. And it doesn't give us enough time for good emotional exposition. I was reminded of Tenet watching this movie because sometimes you just bounce so quickly between scenes. I'm like, I don't have any time to spend with Cruella. 
let's get inside her head a little bit, you know, like thinking of thinking of like Joaquin Phoenix's Joker a movie. This film drew inspiration from there's a lot of scenes when there's no dialogue in Joker. He's just sitting there like he's just stewing or thinking or or or, you know, feeling sorrow over something like you don't get a lot of time to do that in this movie. It's just moving. Now, it does move, which is very effective for a children's film. It definitely keeps your attention, which is good. But yeah, right around like an hour 45, I was starting to tune out like, okay, where's this going? And then it picks up for this whole third act that it doesn't, that, that is important, but I just, I think it could have been a little bit more concise. I, that's really the only real weakness I have for the film. I just think it needed a little bit more, a little bit more trimming. Um, but otherwise it's strong. I, I really like the presentation. I like the way it looks. I, I loved the costuming. I, I know Andy and I are not the best to talk about dressing and corsage uh but the co if we if look if the two of us notice the costuming by god so they must be doing something really fantastic um so yeah i i did want to mention the music by the way andy did you notice the overabundance yeah. of soundtrack yeah there's a ton of music cues and uh needle drops i guess as they they call them um a lot of them most worked for me but it's kind of a who's who of 60s and 70s um music uh, there's so many yeah it, it's a lot and it, it, it adds a lot um i i enjoyed the soundtrack i was actually listening to it uh er, earlier today um with an original song by flinch in the machine oh, i didn't know that i need to go back and find that um yeah a, a, like you said a series of needle drops a who's who of music at one point you know because because even christine noticed at some point she kind of looked over she goes hey there's a lot of licensed music in this it's like i know like there's a ton if it's not a cover of a song it's the actual song at one point they played zeppelin and i was like led zeppelin is not cheap to put in movies and then like two scenes later they're playing rolling stones and like rolling stones not cheap to put in movies so I'm not sure why that is. I feel like it wasn't put there intentionally. I feel like some group of, I don't know, directors or somebody at Disney sat in a room and watched this and was like, it's too slow. It's too quiet. It needs something. So they just shot it up with a bunch of music, but it's still good. That doesn't make it a bad movie. If anything, it gives you a soundtrack to go check out on Spotify. So, you know, for what it's worth, not bad, just noticeable. And I can't remember the last time there were so many needle drops in a film that I like noticed it obviously within the first half hour. Um, just a lot. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Anyway, uh, uh, any other thoughts or recommendations, Andy? I'm ready. Andy, would you recommend Cruella? Absolutely. I was really surprised uh, that I enjoyed this. I haven't enjoyed a lot of the Disney remakes. This is definitely one of the better ones, if not the best uh, Disney remake that, that's happened over the last few years. We get an original story, a very compelling background of a, of a, of a well-known character. We get incredible performances from Emma Thompson and Emma Stone. We rewrite history a little bit and kind of do away with some of the problematic elements of the, the original uh, villain. We get a lot of nods to the original. We have, again, good performances by the supporting cast as well mark strong is in this as well forgot to mention him uh but i was really surprised highly recommend and i saw it in theaters now zach you saw it in in at home i did i did watch it at home and you're right mark strong is totally in this film and i 100 percent forgot he was in this movie because normally he's the big bad and he's just like He's like the butler to the big bad. He's not even anyway. Yeah. Um, I did watch this at home. Uh, it was okay. I, I do think it would have been better in a theater. I mean, that 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 goes without saying, especially for the visuals. Like, I, I think, uh, um, you know, if you appreciate cinematography, if that's something you ever really notice uh, or, or, or kind of active direction, I think you like watching this in a theater a lot more than watching it at home. But that's just me. As for recommendations, I'd wait till streaming. Uh, I, I like this a lot, but I don't think there's any reason to rush out to a theater to see it. Um, you know, if you need something to go see with family, friends, go for it. It's PG-13. It's light. It'll work. It's a little long, but I'll give you something to talk about around the dinner table. Um, but if you're thinking about spending $30 on Disney Plus and it's like you're only going to watch it once for it comes to like to streaming in three months or whatever just just wait like you're not you know it, it is ultimately a disney live action film but it is a, a strong step in the right direction i would like to see them doing more productions like this overall not that bad just not something i was going to say about disney's corella good on them shoot <laughs> yeah and with that we should move to things that are coming out like we said at the top big summer Big summer at the movies. It's going to be a hot movie summer, all right? And we want to talk about what's coming. Andy and I talked about briefly before we started the show how to split up this outline. We never really landed on what we're going to do. Andy, you want to do two and two? Do you want to take a month? What are you thinking, man? 
let me start with just uh, these these couple. So, um, what's coming out in June? We, we got a few big hits uh, starting yes. this Friday with uh, the Conjuring. The Devil Made Me Do It, which I believe is the fourth installment of the Conjuring series, which has uh, been a very successful horror series. Um, which I, I've seen, I think, like one and a half of. Uh, so that's coming out this this week, and that's both in theaters and HBO Max. Uh, yes. Followed by next week, the big uh, release is Lin Manuel Miranda's In the Heights, which was a uh, musical he did prior to um, Hamilton, and that will be theaters only. So that's a film musical, uh, and I'm really looking forward to that. I as well, and it's going to sound goofy, but also my mom is looking forward to it in the heights. But I figure I should say that because I think she, I think she listens to this show. <laughs> anyway, yeah, in the heights actually looks pretty good. It's got a couple of stars from Hamilton. Anthony Ramos is what appears to be the lead, and uh, oh my god, uh, I'll remember his name in a minute. Somebody else is also in it from Hamilton. Uh, additionally, in June, we have The Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard, sequel to The Hitman's Bodyguard, starring Ryan Reynolds and Samuel L. Jackson. If you have been anywhere near a theater in the last six months, you have overheard a trailer for this movie because it is in <laughs> front of everything. Before A Quiet Place 2, which I went and saw last night with a buddy, uh, they ran a trailer for this where they had Selma Hayek on Zoom talking about how great this movie is going to be when people come see it. It was it was ridiculous, um, but, you know, an exciting action comedy if you're into that kind of thing. And then next up, the real action comedy everybody's looking forward to F9 Fast 9, the Fast Saga coming out June 25th, which, uh, you know, I, th I think is going to probably be a big hit here. I think people are going to be stoked after the pandemic, just like A Quiet Place 2. They're going to want to get back in seats. Fast nine is familiar. Make you watch it. Nostalgia bait. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure I haven't. Okay. The conjuring I've seen, I, I genuinely don't think I've seen any of them. And this is like the third or fourth film. And I think it's the third proper film in the conjuring saga. Fast nine. However, I think I stopped watching it like five. Like I don't, I don't remember them. I, maybe I've seen a couple of them. I, mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you. Most uh, recent was Hobson shop to kind of clarify the conjuring. So the, it's based on the files of uh, Ed, Ed and, and Lorraine Warren. Warren. That's yes, right. The case, so, the true, based on the true case files. Right. So these were real people who like were ghost hunters or, or something, and they wrote stories or had some files, or they allegedly you know had evidence of the paranormal. I'm sure it wasn't real, but the Conjuring has kind of jumped on these people as characters, and you know, in this fictional universe, they they are hunting ghosts and kind of finding them and, and helping out the communities which they are uh, affecting. Um, which I always say that someone needs to do a bit about like someone moving, saying, oh, we have to move out of the house. And then and the dad's like, hey, wait a minute. We just we just bought this thing. We got a great deal on it. We're not moving in. Yeah. You see these property taxes? I'm not moving for anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, so Keep moving in. Just getting by. Exactly. So moving into uh, July, uh, the first weekend over the July 4th weekend, of course, we get the return of the Purge series in the Forever Purge, uh, where the Purge is continuing beyond uh, the, the one day it's supposed uh, to be. So that it will be an appropriate 4th of July Independence Day release, followed by Black Widow, the first real, I guess, is it even phase four? Because it, it's technically a prequel. I think it's I thought it was the launch of phase four. I was under the impression that's what Black Widow is. But like, yeah. maybe I've got it wrong. I, I really no, I think know. that's right. I mean, I, I think that happened with the Spider-Man, but we, we're still in prequel territory, though. We're still in things that happened kind of before the, the very end of, of phase three, I think. Yeah, uh, I, I think but the, the first real Marvel movie in over a year, um, almost two years since uh, the the pandemic started. So. That'll be the second big release of uh, July. Uh, Zach, tell us what we got coming up after that. Yes, uh, we're going to have Space Jam, A New Legacy on July 16th. Yes, the exciting sequel to the Michael Jordan Looney Tunes starring film starring LeBron James as a up-and-coming basketball star who's going to crush it in the digital space. Um, and we're also going to get Old on July 23rd. Uh, that is M. Night Shyamalan's new film. And now we're just talking about before the beginning of that movie, man, that seems like a horror gimmick. If, if I say hi, a quiet place too is a horror gimmick with like monsters that hear you. So you have to be quiet. Old is a hundred percent a horror gimmick, a beach that makes you old faster that you can't escape. My God, 
I shouldn't be so skeptical going into old, but I watched the trailer again last night for Quiet Place, and I was just like, dude, <laughs> like it's just it just looks like the tightest seventy five minute film. Like I do not even see how you can get feature length out of that. But I, what do yeah. I know? I mean, the big it, the big issue is that you have to have you got to have a good payoff. You don't necessarily need a twist, which I know he's known for, but you got to have a really really good and compelling reason, or you got to have some really great scares along the way. Something. I have a feeling it's not going to deliver, but that's the thing about I'm not Shyamalan. Like you really don't know. He's really hit and miss. Like he could come out with the hottest garbage or like the biggest hit of the year. Like you just don't know. That's right. He swings for the fences every time. Every time. Damn it. Next up, we've got Snake Eyes on July 23rd. That is the G.I. Joe origin story for the hero Snake Eyes from the G.I. Joe gang. There have been two G.I. Joe films, uh, the last of which starred Channing Tatum as kind of our titular hero. And this starring Henry Golding is the origin of his cool katana wielding uh, uh, faceless ninja sidekick Snake Eyes. Uh, it looks OK. Uh, looking at the trailer, honestly, it's um, I feel like it's a worse trailer than Mortal Kombat. And like that's not a good that's not a good thing because Mortal Kombat had a good trailer but was a bad movie. This seems like it's gonna it's a bad trailer and it's also gonna be a bad movie. But I don't know for sure. But I like Henry Golding, so hopefully you know something comes out of that. Uh, do you want me to do these last two or do you want to pick up the reins? I mean, I don't. I can I don't finish know. it up. I, I Please do. It. And also, also just uh, my recording cut out and I had to restart it just right then. That's okay. <laughs> but yeah. you were talking, but I think we were fine. Um, yeah. So to finish out July, we have Disney's jungle cruise, which is, uh, the rocks uh, starring the rock Dwayne Johnson, um, and Emily Blunt as, uh, they're making another movie about a ride. And, uh, yeah, Disney you know, ride. Lo looks like a little bit of an Indiana Jones romancing the stones, uh, situation, uh, Dis Disney, fied I'm, I'm sure it'll make uh, a billion dollars. Followed by what we have been looking forward to forever, The Green Knight, which is uh, the A A24 uh, tale of uh, Gawain, who goes to fight the Green Knight starring Dev Patel. We are so excited about that, and that's at the end of July, July 30th. We are excited. At the end of June, we've got Fast 9 coming out. And I said, that's when all of like the normal people are going to go back to the theaters, right? That's when all like the, the, the normal action theater stands are going to show up. July 30th, the Green Knight, that's when the weirdos are coming out. That's like the hipsters and the cinephiles. That's where we're going to be, by God. Front row. <laughs> that's that's i'm so turning out for the green knight i'm very excited about the green knight if you haven't seen the trailer for the green knight go check it out it looks like good stuff so hopefully hopefully it'll be you know good stuff and that's june and july at the movies and that's just some of the stuff that's coming out that doesn't include streaming services this doesn't include you know off weeks this is just like the mainstays and man oh man we are going to be busy at least what two of the probably three of these weeks we're going to do double features it's going to be a mess yeah be a mess Right. And that, that was actually the big thing about today's show is that this is the first time we've done two in theater releases in over a year and a half. Yeah, which is a big deal. Um, and, and fortunately, I was able to watch one of them at home, but easily could have gone to see the second at the theater. It's not every day that happens. I'm also excited to talk about the theatrical experience while we were there. Before we jump into A Quiet Place 2, because that'll be next. Andy, I'm curious. When you saw it, how many people were in your theater? Of uh, Cruella or A Quiet Place? I guess both. A uh, handful, not I mean, not more than ten people, and and a quiet place was in the big five hundred person theater. So quiet place two was in like a it was not five hundred person theater. It was like a two two hundred person theater in our in our screen. Um, we opted, me and my buddy opted not to buy tickets online because during the pandemic you haven't needed to, and also online conveniences bite, man. Don't ever pay that two dollars if you don't have to. Just show up and buy it buy it at the box office. Uh, so we showed up to like, you know, go to our, go to our theater and do our thing. They were like sold out. I was like, you sold out on a Monday night and the box house person was like, well, it's Memorial Day. I was like, oh my God, you're right. I mean, it's a holiday, but still selling yeah. out to a movie is a big deal. Uh, turned out they still had two seats available, handicap seats, cha-ching. Fortunately, I didn't get kicked <laughs> out. That would have sucked. Um, Cause that is it. Well, worth mentioning. That is a deal, by the way, uh, at Cinemark and AMC. You can request handicap seats. They can sell them to you. But if somebody rolls up in a wheelchair, you got to move. Like that's, that's the deal. So, you know, in case you ever in a pinch and you need to get into a sold out theater, check those handicap seats. It might work out for you, but a really surprising show of 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 people who are ready to get back to the movies I, I i couldn't i was like stunned walking in that theater so i was like oh my god i haven't seen a full theater in what since early 2020 maybe probably 2019 it's crazy crazy mm -hmm. 
And with that, we should move into the proper review and be taking the summary on this one. So please excuse my clumsy delivery. The movie is A Quiet Place Part 2. So Quiet Place Part 2 is the continuing story of the Abbott family led by Emily Blunt, the matriarch, in the absence of their father character, played by John Krasinski. Lee is his name. Uh, Emily Blunt has to lead her children to a, a new home to get find a fresh start in a world that has been overturned by a ravenous alien species that survives on sound and depends on sound to be able to find their prey and their food uh these monsters travel the world at lightning speed on these big spindly spider legs they have and they attack anything that makes any sound at all so people are barefoot and they're walking on sand and they're whispering and being as quiet as possible to make sure not to alert obviously the monsters uh, if you've seen the first one you know where this is coming from this this film also stars killian murphy as a surprise new character that may be out to help or maybe out to hurt the abbott family uh we have our returning stars emily blunt uh millicent simmons and noah jupe uh so not too shabby the movie is like 95 minutes a movie length i can get on board with the movie is a quiet place part two andy what'd you think uh i really enjoyed it uh for a lot of reasons you don't i i think you just have to be in on board with the with the gimmick about the the aliens and, and the sound so i i'm totally on board with that but also there's a, a lot of tension it does a lot of horror things right there's a lot of body horror there's a lot of things that make you wince and kind of like you know make you tense up in in pain uh it's unclear what the goals are and, and what people, what will happen. You know, it's not necessarily predictable, um, but I like the, the mood. I like how everything looks. The, it looks like a, a post-apocalyptic, uh, you know, situation. Everyone's like gear and their costuming is done really well. Like we were talking about how Angelina Jolie does not look like a firefighter at all. in uh, those, those who, who wish, wish me dead. Yeah, right. And, and that's one thing I like. The world is very convincing. Like when we go to these abandoned places, and we see the aftermath. Uh, the, the environments are are very convincing. It also has a really great opening scene, which is kind of the uh, shows our first day when these aliens have crash landed and start attacking. No one really knows what's going on. It's just pure chaos. Um, so a, a really good opening scene uh, to it. So I, I really enjoyed it. I, I thought it was exciting and a lot of tension and you know not too long. Oh, I did have another strange screening where my picture cut out. How did this like, happen two weeks in a row? I don't know. I'm cursed. The picture cut cursed. out like halfway through Act Three in a very pivotal moment. Uh, luckily, so they did eventually get it fixed, and they came back and like it, you know we were it was off for about ten minutes, and and they fixed it on the right spot. You'll have to tell me which part it was in the film because I'm really curious. Um, yeah, it's fine. We'll, we'll talk about it after the show. Um, it um, definitely did did kind of ruin ruin the the third act, but it's uh, but it was fine. Up until then, but yeah, that's two films in a row where the pictures cut out. Dude, you got to start getting. First off, you need to start going to a different theater, which is a shame because that one you go to is right next to you. Uh, but secondly, uh, you guys are getting the first one was a things, different. Man. The first one was an AMC in Houston. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. right, right, right. Okay, I thought these were both happening at the same place. I was like, you got to go somewhere else. Okay. Well, then you know, AMC and cinema, they're all bad. That's that's the only answer. Anyway, I actually like this movie a bit. Um, I you know I enjoy it. It's it's a good popcorn horror flick. Um, somebody said once recently when I was looking at an early, like looking at an early look at uh, the Conjuring, the Devil Made Me Do It, the new Conjuring film, uh, that the Conjuring movies are like fast food horror films, and like this is not quite that. It's got a little bit more nuance to it, but it's popcorn horror. Like you you can go to the theater and watch this with your family and friends. Everybody's gonna be fine, right? Like you're not gonna see anything that's too horribly scarring or anything like it's 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 rated r but it's I, I it's almost a soft r how many times how many times they drop the f-bomb in this movie maybe once maybe i don't even think it actually right. happens like it's yeah, and, and it's it's and hardly the an r yeah and the violence isn't like super graphic and gory no a lot of it's just yeah, implied uh, and kind of blurred Right. When the, when these monsters run up on somebody, they kind of just like hit them out of the way and then keep running. Like they never like stop and like munch or anything. Like you're never getting entrails flying across the screen. Like it's like, it's, it's, it's good horror. And when I say it's gimmicky before we jump into the proper review here, let me explain it's, it's gimmicky in the way like tremors is gimmicky. Right. But that's not bad. Tremors is actually a really cool movie that has a lot of great things going on for it. And John Krasinski returns to the director's chair here in fine form. He actually does a lot in this movie that I thought was really creative. He plays a lot with lighting. 
um, a lot of editing and, and simultaneous storytelling actually going on in this film, which was not present in the first one. And just like A Quiet Place 1, this movie has almost no fat whatsoever. It's stunning how little fat these movies have. Every scene feels important. It is not wasting your time. It is effective. And if it doesn't need to give you more details about something, just doesn't, right? You don't need to know necessarily in the first film where the monsters come from. What matters is that they're there and they're a problem. You don't need to know what this guy walking around the woods randomly is all about. It's just some dude who's walking around the woods. Like, and I like that about these movies. It's effective. It's good storytelling. I just, I'd like to see them do more, but let's jump into a quiet place. Part two. Uh, Andy, I think the best place to start is our plot. And let me give a little bit more of an explanation than I did in kind of our open. We follow immediately after the events of the first film. Within seconds of the events of the first film ending is where A Quiet Place Part 2 picks up. Uh, we get a bit of a look back at kind of the, the opening of, of how this all happened. Day one of the uh, event, I guess, is what it's called in the, in, in the film. Uh, and then we are immediately caught up with the Abbott family uh, trying to figure out what they're going to do. Their house is on fire. They have a dead monster in their basement. They don't even know what they're going to do next. So they kind of set out. They realize, you know, the house is going to burn down. We're not going to save it. We got to get out of here and go somewhere new. And they, they, they kind of begin this, this, this trail to, to go somewhere. They don't even really know where. And um, they end up coming across Killian Murphy's character, who is a bit of a, a bit of a rogue, a, bit of a vagabond out on his own, doing his own thing. Uh, and they say, hey, you should help us. We, we, we might have a way to defeat these things. You should come with us. And he's like, I'm not really into that. I'm kind of doing my own thing. And then through one way or another, he gets involved and we kind of end up on this big Abbott family adventure for round two. And, and, and Krasinski definitely keeps the family in the spotlight. Um, they get a little split up here. Uh, a couple of them go one way and a couple go the other for, for a portion of the film, actually a sizable portion of the film, but it does a really good job of bouncing back and forth often cutting suspenseful scenes in between one another we'll have we'll have the sun over in the abandoned factory holding a flashlight looking around him and the flashlight flashes across the screen he'll transition right then to the daughter on the beach in another place with her flashlight going across the screen she's looking around too really good duality really good visual uh, uh, storytelling while also keeping the audience grounded in what everybody's doing it never feels like oh we're not really paying attention to what the sun's doing he's not important and, oh, we're not really paying attention to what the daughter's doing. She's not important. No, everybody gets equal time here. It's good. It actually works really well. I, it's it's rare that I see a horror film be able to stitch together pieces of a story um, so consistently. Yeah, I, he keeps the family. I, I think keeping the family as kind of the main central focus of the film really keeps it together. It, it was the same thing in the first one. The difference is here is the the father is, is not there. Uh, Killian Murphy becomes kind of a surrogate uh, father figure in this, but they, you know, they still got to stick together. They got to work together. And that, that unfortunately it means splitting up a little bit uh, throughout the film. And, you know, Killian Murphy in insinuates or points to this idea that like, you know, the people that are left, uh, you know, aren't really great people. And it, it really reminds me of, if you've seen the road, uh, the Cormac McCarthy yeah. uh, film slash book that, which is also post apocalyptic where, you know, they're trying to maybe find a community or find some other survivors. And he's saying, you don't want to find the people that are left to find um, <laughs> insinuating that, that society is kind of devolved uh, in, in a lot of ways and in a lot of unpleasant ways. The insinuation yeah. is very intense. I was totally wrong. This is a PG 13 feature. I thought this was rated R. I could have sworn I read that in an article somewhere. All right. IMDb says it's PG 13. So for what it's worth. Um, yeah, he, I, I think this film a little suffers from unexpected sequelitis, uh, which is a term I've just made up right here on the spot. Um, let me tell you a little story about back to the future. Cause I think this will be a good explanation of my point. Uh, Andy does not like back to the future. Andy, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> at the end of back to the future, Marty McFly returns to his present time, 1985, and he finds the world has changed from when he was back in 1955. Things are different. Right. And, and now he has uh, he has the truck he's always wanted and his mom and dad are cool and his girlfriend isn't mad at him anymore. Everything worked out. But then right at the end, right when he gets everything he wants, Doc Brown shows up from the future wearing a wacky outfit in a slightly different DeLorean. And he's like, Marty, you got to come back with me back to the future. We got to go do something else. And Marty goes, all right, well, let's do it. What, what, what about Jennifer? Throw her in the car. It'll be great. 
They hop into DeLorean. It turns this hover car thing. They take off. It says to be continued. It's over. So here's the problem. Back to the Future ends on a gag. None of that was ever supposed to happen. There was never supposed to be a sequel to Back to the Future. They thought maybe, maybe there would be, but we're not sure because it's a really weird movie. Then the movie came out and it was huge and it took off and they were like, oh shoot, we need to make a sequel to this, especially because we set it up to look like there was going to be a sequel. So they made Back to the Future 2. And the problem was, what do we do with the girlfriend in the car? Because they had set this up where they didn't <laughs> actually plan on having a sequel. And now we have the girlfriend in the DeLorean. How do we get rid of her? And then in Back to the Future 2, there's a whole plot line about what you're going to do with Jennifer. Because she's not supposed to be in the movie. Like they, they had no intention for her to come with. This, in a way, structurally has the same problem. There was never supposed to be a Quiet Place Part 2. This is a one-off. John Krasinski said it was a one-off. Emily Blunt said it was a one-off. She's his wife. She knows. Like this is was, this was a one-off film. And then it came out and it did so well. The studio was like, you got to make another one. And this movie is lacking a central character that I think would have really elevated it. And that character is John Krasinski. Mm -hmm. He is shockingly absent from this film. And literally the plot of the movie is trying to fill the John Krasinski shaped hole in the movie. And it hurts it. Would it be better if they were all one big happy and everything was going? No, actually, I think the ending to a quiet place is really strong. But I think this movie oversteps just a little in trying to be like, I don't know, we, we've got big dad energy without dad around, you know, <laughs> but but it is it does follow immediately after the events of the previous film. This family is in mourning. It makes sense. Like, it's not wrong. I just feel like from a writing perspective, I either wish he was there or I wish they figured out a way to pivot a little bit more. Did you did you feel that at all? Andy, am I crazy? I, I guess maybe because enough time has passed. I really didn't miss john krasinski's presence but that's just because i can't really remember the first film very much um i just remember that the family unit being like a very strong uh you know part of the first movie and then also part of this one yeah um and also i like watching john krasinski on screen he is in the opening uh, and he's very good in that and i think that sets a really good um you know it, it, it's exact setup for that. that's the setup for the john krasinski shaped hole in the movie it's like hey he's not going to be here like this this kind of hero character who you see running around and kind of telling the family what to do and get everything together like he's not going to be around and they're gonna have to figure that out on their own which is good um it does have i should say quite an abrupt ending i did not you had mentioned it had an abrupt ending and i don't think it's spoilers saying that but it really comes up on you um yeah i did credits feel like and the lights came up and i was like oh okay <laughs> that's yeah, the movie got it it feel it feels like there there was another 15 20 minutes uh waiting around or like it, the story wasn't it feels quite like there's, wrapped. A, there's a part and, and waiting around yeah i was gonna say it, it seems like it's it purposely is just leaning towards a third sequel um but yeah i, I agree it was a little abrupt which, um, you know, I don't know how far that's going to get. Obviously, we're in the in the age of movie universes. They've called this part two. It seems like there will likely be a part three. But for what it's worth, um, again, quiet verse. what I read back in the day, right, quiet verse. Emily Blunt and John Krasinski didn't want to do this movie. John Krasinski was like, I kind of want to move on to something different, right? Like, I this is I, I, going to be my second directorial feature. Maybe I should get into something new. She was like, ah, I only really did it because he was doing it anyway. I guess they, they, they must have gotten some fat checks to do a second one, but they, I mean, they, they, they'll probably do one more and that's it. I, I don't see them doing yeah, four A Quiet Place movies. I bet both of them do one and they'll be like, that's all. And then if we do A Quiet Verse, it'll be a different director and a different family in the similar event, right? Like, I think that'll be... Because, I yeah, I'd see them making 15 of these movies. Why not, right? They keep making Quiet Place movies forever. Yeah, um, I mean, how, how success many songs... Yeah, how many songs... Like, how many saw? You can yeah. just keep making saw traps, you know, so just keep having situations like this. Yeah, you're going to make gonna go make to the Annabelle alien planet. And, it's going to turn to yeah. Starship Troopers. Yeah, you can do all you can do all kinds of stuff, which is good. And and like I said, this movie, part of the reason you can kind of grow the universe that way is because it doesn't have any fat. It doesn't waste any time trying to explain itself. It just goes, ah, we'll, we'll worry about that later. Yeah, I don't think about that. And it's effective because you're focused on horror. You're focused on the scares. You're not here for like the backstory. It works. Um, I do want to talk about kind of the, the look of this movie. Um, it's away from this farmhouse home that was pretty much entirely where the first film was shot, but it's very low budget. Um, this movie is cheap to make. Um, and it's really effective, like you said, in its looks, its settings, and its landscape. Everything looks like it was just ravaged 
by some kind of beast, right? There's holes in walls and train cars have metal ripped out of the side where something exploded out the back of it. And like everything looks like it was just trashed and left for like a year, which is exactly what it's supposed to look like in this movie. It's really, really solid, like post-apocalyptic set design while also looking very pretty. Sun coming through the trees, right? Everything's green. Nature's doing very well. Um, It's a really cool visual dichotomy. It reminds me of like Naughty Dog's Last of Us games. Uh, just really good looking stuff. Yeah, like I said, the the world and the environment um, is really, really convincing. And I think that's what helped really bring me into the world because everyone looks tired and dirty and tattered and clothes are just kind of half hanging together. Like you feel like you're really in this this post-apocalyptic world. Yeah, and additionally, I think Krasinski learned a little bit from the first film not to lean so hard on jump scares, which was what really felt like the gimmick in the first film was. It was like jump scares the movie, right? Everything's going to be quiet, then something's going to get loud. That's that's the whole point. This movie actually doesn't have as many, I don't think, um, that I recall. It, it's a little bit more... Uh, it said, sets a little bit more of a tone, I think. It's, it's a little bit more suspense. Like, your characters will be in a suspenseful situation, less like big jump scares and that's a positive um because i I felt like that was something i I didn't really like in the first film but good good audio mixing here i actually they they introduced some new elements to kind of the idea of trying to be quiet and make it interesting things like rain water right Uh, um, um, bodies of water sand i don't know I, i it's creative in its presentation but it's hard for me to to distance this from many other horror sequels as being a bit a bit more of a cash grab and less a bit less of a sincere a sincere mm-hmm. something you know but uh, that's just me what do I know I, I I we do a movie podcast I'm I'm jaded about everything Andy you ready for uh, for <laughs> recommendations I am Andy would you recommend a Quiet Place Part Two I would I really enjoyed it I think it's a good follow up good sequel uh, we get some backstory on on the first day that the aliens arrive we get a new situation where they have to leave the safety of like the farmhouse to get like supplies and try to find other people we get people getting injured we have people have to go into dangerous situations roving gangs of post like a little bit of Mad Max the road <laughs> uh, kind of uh, cohorts um it looks really good it's not too long it's a good length what is it, 100 minutes uh yeah, something like uh, like 97 minutes it's not very long yeah so it's 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 a perfect length for what it is and it'll be on Paramount Plus in 45 days so i would recommend yeah i'd recommend it as well um i mean similar to Cruella i wouldn't rush rush out to the theater to see it but if you got some friends or something or you're bored and need something to do like it's 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 not a bad way to kill 97 minutes if you like the first film i think you'll enjoy it uh, if you haven't seen the first film, I would recommend probably watching that before this. I feel like this movie it does a decent job of explaining what happened in the first movie, but I think the first one is probably the stronger film of the two. Um, but this one's not bad, and and a good a good continuation of a story. Like it feels like it picks up very quickly. Actors are good. The child actors are solid in it, just like the first movie. No Jupe and Millicent. What is her name? Simmons. Uh, Simmons is solid. Um, not that bad, honestly. Yeah, I, it's not really for me. It feels a little gimmicky, but what horror movie doesn't, right? That's kind of what horror movies are. They're kind of just gimmicks on wheels. And with that, we should wrap the show. Uh, Andy, what are we watching next week? Well, I, I just remembered uh, one title I, I wanted to uh, to mention. Hit me with it. And that is uh, the Texas Theater will be showing Mad Max Black and Chrome uh, next weekend. Oh, which dude. I, which okay, I definitely on. want want to crash. <laughs> hold on. All right, listen. Andy and I had plans of what we we're going to watch next week. We need to we need to amend these post haste. Abort. What, <laughs> Abort. What what are we getting rid of to watch this movie? Because I'm. Um, oh, dude, I already. Oh, I know what we're getting rid of, and I already watched it. Damn it. We could get. Right. We, we get well, okay, we got some options next week. We for, the, the Conjuring, the Devil Made Me Do It, is on HBO Max this Friday. It's Those true. who wish me dead is also uh, already available on HBO Max. Um, we, we will. We'll decide what else we're watching, but we definitely will we'll try to get a th- the scre- to the screening of Mad Max Black and Chrome Listen, at the historic Texas Theater. I have been begging to go back to the Texas Theater since 2020. Like, I, there's no better way to come back in glorious Black and Chrome than in <laughs> than in Mad Max Fury Road Black and Chrome edition. Um, 
Oh, dude. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll figure. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. But mm-hmm. we will be watching one of those films, The Conjuring, or Those Who Wish Me Dead, starring Angelina Jolie. Uh, keep it here on Oscript for more. If you enjoyed the show today, if you enjoy our clever banter, our unorganized orthodox attitude, <laughs> uh, you can find out more about us at our website offscriptfilmreview.com. You can find us on Facebook where we live stream the show every single Tuesday right around 5 p.m. CST. Uh, we're on YouTube where we post our episodes. We're on I do Instagram and Twitter. You can find us over there. And of course, our audio podcast is available wherever you're hearing it right now. It could be iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartMedia, any one of those places. Pod Chaser, Geo Zavon. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of pod, podcast outlets out there. And I think we're on at least most of them, I hope. So you can find us at those places. And if there's anything you'd like to do to help us out, show a little support, the best thing you can do is just subscribe. Subscribe to Offscripts and get new episodes every single week delivered straight to your phone. Movies are expensive. Podcasts are cheap. Come listen to our podcast. Keep listening to Offscript from a review. And also, you know, leave a rating or review if you could swing it. Leave a review of your own. How about that for a change? I don't know. Uh, anyway, <laughs> from all of us. And oh, oh, God. And I forgot you can write correspondence. Jesus, I almost forget this every week. You can write into the show. You can you can, you can comment on Facebook or, or you can comment on YouTube or you can hit us on Twitter or you can write us at mail at offscriptfilmview.com. Tell us what you thought of Cruella. Tell me I'm crazy about A Quiet Place too, and it's way better than I think it is, even though I feel like I recommended it. I don't, I don't know. Write it into the show. We'll read your correspondence live on the air, assuming it's clean and, you know, cool. Anyway, from all of us at Offscript, the home of Bold Cinema, I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Thanks for watching.